Let's see. Here's your. Oh, thank you. There's. A, I'll, I'll give you. I've yeah, got some okay. stuff for you. All right, thank you. Better get my glasses. I'm getting hot. You've added a, a little bit more gray since I saw you yeah, last. Yeah. Stressful job. He's, he's, <laughs> he's coming. Again. Sure, we'll, we'll say that. We'll say yeah. you, but you look younger and, and told. <laughs> All right, Doc. Thanks again. Great yes. to see you. Appreciate your time. Um, you're the first person I thought of when I saw this. <laughs> it really good. It, it came out and it it made it sound as if, boy, this is the nail in the coffin. For right. Kind of yeah. Numbers. What's your take on? Yeah, it's definitely not the nail in the coffin, Bert. This is this is a um, this is kind of a rehash of some of the the same stuff that's been coming out of out of. Um, Danish studies and studiers for quite a while. In fact, the, there's a lot of problems with the study. The first one goes back to, you know, to the, the point of who funded it, who's participating in it. And as a former medical editor of a medical journal, I can tell you that I, when I analyze these papers, I always go to what's the funding source and what's, you know, who's involved in it. <clears throat> Those disclosures are right in the document. Well, you have to click on a link to see those disclosures, but those disclosures indicate a pattern of conflicts of interest. Several of the of the editors themselves are invested heavily in, in pharmaceutical, Pfizer, Eli Lilly. I mean, a medical journal should not have their editors heavily invested in pharmaceutical, you know, the same interests that are, that they're publishing, you know, research data on. The, this pub, this study itself was, published by or was funded by Novo, Novo Nordisk, a pharmaceutical entity in, in the Netherlands, and, um, and they are um, heavily involved and interested in the production of vaccines. So you have, the, you, you have an industry-funded medical study, and, but it's a, it's a research study that we also have to look at the methodology that was used. This is a retrospective case control cohort study. It's a big number of children. They're using the, they're, first of all, they never looked at a medical chart. It says it right in, you know, on the first page. Limitation, no, no individual medical charts were reviewed. This is epidemiology being used to do medical research. It's prone to a whole bunch of opportunities for bias. The first opportunity for bias and a study of this nature is in selecting the cases. They're looking at um, a database that is a registry of the children in, in Denmark. That, that study is, or that, that data is very limited. It's a very, you know, it, 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 it has, um, it doesn't have all of the medical chart information. It doesn't have, you know, what other comorbid conditions do they have, et cetera. It's very prone to the, the investigator selecting information out of that cohort study that on a very biased basis. The, the first evidence that there's bias in this study is that the, the reported incidence of autism in the population was about half what it is in the Danish population. That's a real, that's kind of a smoking gun that the investigators, when they were selecting the cases and they were selecting the case controls, they were they somehow didn't get a representative population for the of the Danish population, uh, and it's kind of complex. The you know the overall issue I think that we have with a lot of these medical research publications is that it's very complex. The science is messy. The statistical analysis is is difficult for a layperson and even the media, even somebody as smart as you, Bert, being able to understand. You know the complexities are involved here. But there's so many opportunities for bias. The the senior editors of the British Medical Journal and and Lancet have both said about 85% of the medical research is fraudulent. Was there anything in the study that you felt uh, was groundbreaking or new or tried to examine the issue from a different perspective? No. In fact, it's it's a rehash of something they did in 2002. The same group. Um, uh, Havid, the, the lead author, author in this publication, was also involved in another publication that was um, 
uh, the lead author was Madsen in 2002, using the same kind of data registry cohort analysis that tried to to try to say that that the um, uh, the MMR vaccine was not associated with autism. Then they also did a similar study, the same group, trying to say that thimerosal was not a problem. Which even the here in the United States, we said, well, it's it's enough of a problem that we want to remove it from the vaccines. It's still not removed from all the vaccines. It's still in the the multi-dose vials and specifically the flu shot. So a lot of kids are still getting thimerosal in the United States today. So they were wrong in their analysis then, at least as we saw it here in the United States in the removal of thimerosal. But more importantly, that, that, that same group included um, Dr. Paul Thorson. Um, he is a FBI most wanted um, criminal that was participating in a lot of these studies. In fact, I think it was 21 of 24 studies that the, the CDC was using to say that vaccines were not associated with autism. He was an author in, a co-author in, and Paul Thorson was found um, guilty of fraudulently defrauding the, the CDC of over a million dollars um, that he was paid in grant money to conduct scientific re research on vaccines and, and he misappropriated those funds. Apparently, um, the money was used, but the research wasn't, con wasn't really conducted. Those grants are pretty tight, right? You're given a bunch of money based on the cost of producing research. If, you're, if he's misappropriating those funds, he's not doing the research. So the basis for a lot of the vaccine research in the United States today is is based on the research that was done by an FBI most wanted criminal. And I have a problem with that. Havid was one of the co-authors and one of the cohorts of this Paul Thorson. And the same group is doing the same thing again. If you were to be in charge of the study, what would it look like? Uh, what elements should it have in order to definitively answer the question? Great, great question, and it's an easy answer. It's a retrospective, excuse me, it's a prospective, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial that looks, at, and placebo-controlled, real placebos. That's not what's being done in the vaccination, I'll come back to that, but it, it is gold standard medical science. It's vaccinated versus unvaccinated children, and we have plenty of that of, of those population groups here in the United States to do the study, and we've never done it. In vaccines, we do not do what is required of every pharmaceutical drug put on the market in the United States today. We don't conduct that gold standard science in vaccines. We have given vaccines a special class, a special pass that we have should never have done. That's interesting. So. Uh, and is it because the idea of giving a kid a placebo vaccine could be considered endangering them? I mean, you know what I mean in the in the in the larger picture of thing. If you were to give it, that's the that so that's the that's kind of the premise that is used to say it wouldn't be ethical to do those kind of studies, and yet we do them. We what they do instead, Bert is is even so more it's so egregious so what we use as a placebo in vaccine studies is another vaccine or what we did what Merck did in the Gardasil trials is they used an activated placebo they used a a, a control group that got an activated placebo that contained everything that's in the Gardasil vaccine except the antigen except the HP, the human papillomavirus antigen, got the same amount of aluminum that is in the Gardasil. It's a great way to conduct a, a fraudulent pseudoscientific study where you want to mask the adverse events that occur in the control group and the test group. So the test group being the Gardasil, the control group being the activated placebo group. In that study, um, the same number of of young healthy women and a few young men died or had serious adverse events 
and it made it look like, and Merck could say in the preclinical trials, they could say, see, there was no difference between these two groups. So Gardasil was no worse than placebo. And, and that was a travesty of science, Bert. It was, and it's done all the time. We're not doing saline, true placebo-controlled studies. So we don't really know whether these vaccines are safe and effective. And, and, that, and I'm telling you, I know that that seems almost heretical coming from a medical doctor, but man, I've been studying this for 15 years, and I'm telling you that we're not doing gold standard science in vaccines today. Uh, so are there any studies out there right now, to your knowledge, that are being done that will help answer some of these questions? No. There, I'm not aware of any. Um, the, you know, so many of the studies, they, they, have this, they have this free pass to, to do this. You know, they don't have to do any, you know, vaccinated versus unvaccinated studies, Bert. We've been... The, the industry, medical doctors, physicians for informed consent, a national organization of physicians that are very concerned about this issue are, are screaming for this study, you know, for this, for the NIH, the CDC, for somebody to do a true gold standard scientific analysis that looks at the health outcomes in a vaccinated versus unvaccinated population. Until we have that study, we're not doing real science and vaccines. We don't know whether we're, you know, we're protecting our children or we're causing them harm. In the United States, we have, we've reached a rate where it's one in 36 children have autism. Interestingly, in this study um, out, of, out of the um, Denmark, they, they had one in 100. What's interesting about, so they have one in 100 children and that's what this recent study found in, in Denmark that have autism. We should be asking why do they have, you know, why are, they, why are we 2.7 times worse in our autism rate than they are in Denmark? Well, one of the answers is they do a fraction of the number of vaccines we, that we do in the United States. The back, American children are the most vaccinated population of children in the United States. And still, of all the vaccines that we give children, you know how many um, studies that we've done to, to ask the question, um, are these vaccines safe? How many, how many vaccines have we tested for safety? Let me get to... Uh, well, the answer is, is one. It was an MMR vaccine. We haven't tested polio, DTaP, Hep B. We haven't tested those for true safety. Uh, and just to get to the baseline issue right. here, again, in your medical opinion, should parents be concerned that vaccines could, in fact, cause autism? Yes, they should be. Absolutely. I mean, and, and we won't know definitively, and that's my concern, is we won't know definitively until we do the scientific testing that is the gold standard in medicine, in science, in pharmaceutical drugs of all kinds. We're not doing that in vaccines. Until we do, we simply don't know. But we have increasing um, evidence that, that aluminum adjuvants translocate to the brain, increase inflammation in the brain, and cause brain swelling that can cause damage. We think that, that um, I mean, we have significant the, the evidence that that brain swelling in certain subgroups of children can be significantly more damaging and perhaps permanent. And we're not, we're not doing enough to, we're not doing anything to screen for those risk factors and eliminate those, or, or, or to test those before we start administering vaccines, where we might be giving you know, a child at, at six months, seven to nine vaccines, or at 12 months, 11 to 13 vaccines simultaneously. You know how many studies that we've done to, to test whether multiple vaccines administered at one time are safe? Zero. Um, I often wonder, from your perspective, what does it feel like to be a doctor yeah. preaching what you're preaching in a culture where you're made to look like the outlier? Yeah, it's and lonely. The, that's what I'm saying. It's scary. Um, it's lonely, and and it's you know it's it's. I wish this 
hadn't, I, I wish I didn't know. But, you know, I, I started seeing the evidence of this 15 years ago as, as I was reviewing um, research for publication. And, and, I, you know, and, and I approved two research studies that showed an association of the MMR vaccine with retinal hemorrhages in the back of the eye. You know, inflammation, the premise of those two research studies, one from Italy and one from the West Coast, um, was that the MMR, there was an association with retinal hemorrhages in the back of young infants that was associated with the uh, administration of the MMR vaccine. And I, I recommended both of those publications to be published into the journal. And what I was told is we can't publish those, Jim. Um, and, and I was like, why can't we publish? This is really interesting stuff. It goes in the face of what we, we teach in ophthalmology and medicine. And, and, um, and the, the reason was because Merck was a major founder, a funder and contributor, donor to the, to the university for which I was working at the time. So it seems like you guys are on a, on a perpetual treadmill. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm, as a, as a physician that took an oath to do no harm and as a, you know, former member of the United States military that took an oath to serve and protect, you know, from enemies, both foreign and domestic, when I see the, the pseudoscience, the corporate purchase of medical research that's being published, you know, 85 out of 100 articles being, you know, blatantly, overtly fraudulent. I see this kind of conflict of interest that is poured into a, a, a weak um, research methodology. We, you can't do vaccine safety research with epi epidemiology where you never look at a, a medical chart. You can't do that from a database registry. There's so many inherent biases in that process, and yet this publication comes out the day before they're doing congressional hearings in Washington, D.C. You think that's, you know, that's coincidence? I just don't. I see that we have the most powerful entity in the history of the world, the pharmaceutical industry, that is powerfully involved in making sure that their, you know, $40 billion industry that for which they are not liable. They have product liability immunity granted to them by the United States Congress starting in 1986. And since 1986, we've had this proliferation um, of that. You know, we, there's almost five times more vaccines being administered to children today than there were than there was in the 1960s, 1970s. And we have a dramatic increase in autism. Everybody wants to pretend that it's something else. We don't know what it is, but it's something else. And yet so much of the data points directly to the problem that we have with vaccines. And so I stopped being complacent and silent in the face of something that I see as a scientist as a real travesty in the how we're conducting medical research in this country. It concerns me. My, you know, I have no dog in this fight. I don't make money in any aspect of this. I'm not financially bought. I'm not, I have no conflicts of interest. I'm simply a husband, a father, a, a doctor that says we should demand better. And we are, we are being misled. We're being misled by weak studies that the media is parading all over, it's all over social media that this is the nail in the coffin. This is not the nail in the coffin. This is, this is weak pseudoscience that's funded by industry that's being exaggerated to no end. And it's gotta stop. We should demand better science from, from our institutions. You know, we should demand better science from our doctors, we should demand informed consent be given every time a parent is considering a vaccination for their child. And we should be honest about the fact that we have not truly studied these, these vaccines. It just, it breaks me to think that medicine has come to this point that we are so co-opted by such a powerful industry. And Bert, your industry has been co-opted by pharma. Uh, I mean, it, it's just, 
it, it's, it's harming too many people. And that's why I do what I do. And I, I spend every day worried about when they're gonna come, when they're gonna try to take my license away, when they're going to, you know, um, do what, you know, when they're gonna wake field me or something like that. And that's why there's so many physicians that think just like I do, that are silent. They're sitting on the sidelines because they don't want to step into this arena because it is dangerous. We put our we put our careers, our families, our income on the line, and I don't I don't want to do it. But man, I can't see this happening. I got beautiful grandkids, you know, and it's it goes beyond just the the fact that our children are might be harmed by a vaccine. It's the fact that we we put we believe the the flu things like the flu shot. Are beneficial. The evidence now is that these vaccines actually increase the likelihood that a child that's been recently vaccinated is is three times more likely to be hospitalized if they get a serious infection. That we're almost seven times more likely to transmit those viral particles with every breath, with every sneeze, with every cough. If you get a, a strain of the flu virus after that is different than the one that the vaccine imparted in you with the, the vaccination, the flu vaccine. So if you get a, a flu vaccine that completely misses the circulating pathogens and you get one of those pathogens that, you know, the hundreds that are out there that weren't covered by the four that are in the vaccine, you're almost 700% more likely to transmit that infection to somebody else. We're creating infection in the community. And, and there's the studies and the science and support that are out there, but they never get the coverage. The, the independent research is almost never covered. And then this crap gets covered. This is, this is the same old news from the same old group, bought and, and, and working for industry with a big financial bias, lots of conflicts of interest, and we think that that's relevant science. I'm telling you, it's not. Thanks, Doc. You're good. Yeah. We're gonna fix that yeah. wire. No, yeah, we're good. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. It really is. Appreciate you. You bet. <clears throat> Just try to slide it out. Oh, you bet. Yeah, thank you. Just stay there real quick. Let me get some cover. Yeah. This is one of the this is one of the key studies um, from a leading aluminum researcher in um, in the UK, Christopher Axley, Christopher. and he's he's. He's shown that that aluminum that we inject, and we inject, you know, basically aluminum replaced thimerosal. It's an adjuvant that is um, designed to to stimulate the immune system, and we're we're injecting as much as as four milligrams or four thousand five hundred micrograms of aluminum, <clears throat> and the um, what happens is it gets picked up by macrophages and translocated to the brain. Then it gets deposited throughout the brain, and in children that died with autism, the brain biopsies, the study and analysis of the amount of aluminum that was in their brains is astronomical. It's off the charts. Um, and it's, it's, it, this is the smoking gun that demonstrates, you know, what we're doing wrong. And it's not getting enough coverage, Bert. That's the real news story. Yeah. But nobody will break it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it, it really is a big part of this news story is, well, why is, <coughs> why is um, Denmark's autism rate so much lower, or, you know, than in the United States? Why are, it's, why it's are we the... Yeah, it's one in a hundred. So in two thousand and two, when they did their initial analysis of this of this research, it was one in a thousand. In the last, so and they've added several vaccines since then. Their 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 uh, vaccine schedule is significantly different than ours. Um, here's what the the Danish vaccine schedule looks like. <clears throat> So there's the, the Danish vaccine schedule. Here's the U.S. schedule. 
when there, there's a regression analysis that's been done that looks at the number of vaccines and the, and the rate of autism and uh, in the population of the various countries that have different um, vaccine schedules and the, it tracks directly to the amount of vaccines being given. So the United States has the worst rate of, of autism and, and you know, auto, auto, ASD, autism spectrum disorder. And in, of all of the developed countries, in fact, we're, there are several third world countries that have better rates than us. Uh, we also have the highest infant mortality and, and uh, direct, it, it correlates directly to the amount of vaccines that are being given. Many countries don't, don't even use the MMR. J you know, Japan, um, they broke those, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines into separate vaccines. And, and I think we should at least do the same here in the United States. So is the theory uh, that the, the aluminum, I mean, it, it, just some brains are more, um, if the aluminum thing is what's causing it, that, that some brains are more sensitive to that? Or? No, it's, it looks, um, we're all sensitive to it. All of our brains are sensitive to it. Some people's, um, so the subsets of children that seem to be more susceptible to aluminum are the are ones that have mitochondrial disorders. So the the Hannah Poling case um, is an was a you know the the vaccine court system rule that yeah autism caused by vaccines. This child had a mitochondrial disorder. The the fact of the matter is is that the incidence of mitochondrial disorder in children is very high. Mm -hmm. It's high as 40, 40 Some studies have shown it as high as fifty percent. So at least 25% in every study. So it's, it's far more children than what we realize. Children that have a mitochondrial disorder, another one seems to be the MTHFR gene mutation that makes them less capable of dealing with toxins. So they can't remove toxins from their body as well because they have this gene mutation that codes for an enzyme that's very important in the creation of glutathione. And, and so they have um, these subsets of children are just less capable of dealing with toxins of any kind. Aluminum is a well-known neurotoxin. Um, the, the idea has been we're trying to put as little of that adjuvant in children's bodies, just a small enough dose that it won't cause harm, it will stimulate the immune system, but what we've subsequently found is that it's the smaller doses that escape our body's ability to kind of wall it off and prevent it from being picked up by macrophages. So the po this, the dose doesn't make, always make the poison. And with aluminum, it seems that the lower doses, they escape our body's kind of, it's small enough, they fly underneath, the, the aluminum flies underneath the radar, doesn't get walled off in a granuloma at the injection site. And, and the smaller doses are more capable of being picked up by the macrophages, which are garbage cleaners, the trash cleaners trying to pick this up and carry it away. And, but what they do is these macrophages, um, they retain that aluminum and the smaller doses more so than even the larger doses. And then they get, when they get called to another site of, of activation or inflammation, um, which is often in the brain because of its high metabolic activity, they dump their aluminum there. And, and so that's part of the problem. So um, it, mitochondrial disorders, mitochondria are the little energy organelles in the cells that produce um, ATP. And if you have, you know, if you have less energy reserves, if your power supply is less than someone else, you don't have the capability of kind of activating all the, uh, you know, energizing all of the cellular repair and removal mechanisms that, that uh, someone else might have. So if you have this energy depletion state, you're more susceptible to the vaccines and we're just not testing for it. And we should be. I mean, I, I would not, I, I would test every, every child for these gene mutations before we would give them vaccines. It'd probably be one of the best investments that we could ever make in the health of our nation. Because, I mean, if we continue to increase, you know, in the 1960s is one in 10,000, 
to one in 36 today and one in 28 of those are boys. If we keep progressing at this exponential rate that we've been watching for the last three decades, we are, um, we're not going to have enough people capable of working, paying taxes to support this nation. And that's that's a real concern, you know. It's 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 real. No tinfoil hat here. It's just real science that is not being given the the time of day that it should be. Thanks again. You're welcome. Yeah, appreciate it. Oh boy.